Welcome back to another episode of this shit. Um, so today, it's going to be a short video for the higher levels, or so I think. Um, we're just going to be doing a little bit more on proton and MR spectroscopy. So, um, generally a sample is dissolved free of uh, protons. So, um, DCL4, D2O, C6D6, or D is deuterium. And the tube of the sample solution is spun between the two poles of a strong magnet, uh, sort of as I described in my last video. Uh, and then it's irritated with radio waves and in a spectral, simple spectrometer the sample is subjected to a ra range of frequencies and absorptions uh, which are recorded with a detector. Um, essentially what a proton NMR spectrum is, it's, it's, a, it's essentially a plot versus of absorption versus uh, frequency of radio, uh, radio wave EMR subjected to it. So as you learned in SL Chem, uh, each uh, chemical environment for hydrogen causes the appearance of an absorption peak or a band in the spectrum and the integration traces how many numbers it, uh, hydrogens are in that particular environment which corresponds to that peak. Um, there are, however, okay, fine, but you may have noticed that we use the units of ppm, uh, chemical shift, and not just frequencies of light. What's the problem with that? Um, the problem is that the radio there's at least two problems associated with the measuring and reporting the frequency of absorption. Um, with proton NMR, the range of frequencies is very small that it, that it absorbs. So the frequency difference between the highest and lowest frequencies it absorbs is only about uh, a thousand hertz hertz of each other relative to the radio frequencies being absorbed, which are you know about a hundred hundred megahertz or ten to the this would be about 10 to the 8 hertz, which would be about 10 to the 8 hertz, yep. So 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 8, you can clearly see here that 10 to the 3 is insignificant when compared to 10 to the 8, and therefore since that range is so small, um, it's hard to report frequencies. And then more importantly, the frequency absorbed, the frequency depends on the magnetic field strength itself, and is thus, basically if you use a stronger magnetic field, um, the uh, shifts will change slightly, so the frequencies it'll absorb will slightly change. So the way we do that is we uh, plot the chemical shift relative to a, a standard instead of radio frequency on the x-axis. And here's the formula for shift, which is the sample minus the reference over the operating frequency times 10 to the 6. Um, and the reference method, the reference uh, chemical we use is tetramethylsilane, or TMS. Uh, a small amount of TMS is added before the sample, and this is chosen to be the standard as it only has one chemical environment for hydrogen. They're all in the same environment, and therefore the peak would be very strong and visible. Um, and in addition to it evaporates quickly, so the salt it, so it's gone when you're doing your analysis. So, an HNMR spectrum, a peak for TMS appears on the right side of the spectrum at zero. So this is what we call zero shift. And it means that there's no difference between the frequency that it absorbs and the frequency absorbed by the standard. Be since there's, no, it basically means there's no difference between the um, absorption and the standard because TMS is the standard. Basically, since the, everyone knows what the t since we know where the TMS peak is, we can measure everything relative to it relatively easily. So, here is sort of a spectrum of methyl ethanoate. You can see here two peaks at two and four. Um, which we'll call A and B. These two peaks integrate equally since there's equal numbers of hydrogen in the environment. And yeah. Lastly, the next, the last little bit here is a little bit of extra information. Now, if you have a high resolution spectrum, you can observe these things known as splitting patterns. And this is actually caused by a quantum phenomenon. Uh, I think it's spin spin coupling which I'm not going to explain how it works because even I don't understand how it works. But what you're expected to know is that these, uh, these splitting, the splitting groups can actually be given, will give you information as to neighboring hydrogen environments and how many, they can actually give you information as to na neighboring hydrogen environments. So at its simplest, the number. So as a result, you may see these small little peaks. And so therefore we now use the term peak grouping rather than peak since there are multiple little peaks when we uh, have splitting patterns. Um, 
At its simplest, the number of peaks in a grouping relates to the number of hydrogen atoms attached to carbons. The number of peaks in the grouping. So, yeah, the number of peaks in a peak grouping relate to uh, the number of hydrogen atoms attached to both the carbon atom of interest and what carbon atoms that are adjacent to it. So, the peak groupings can give us information as to the amount of hydrogens in it, what it is, what the what it is in terms of a functional group, and what might its neighbors be doing. So, number of peak. So here is sort of a, a, a sort of a little chart here relating the number of peak groupings to, you know, adjacent carbon. So if we have a singlet, there would be one peak, um, and there is zero hydrogen atoms bonded attached. There are zero neighboring hydrogen environments. If we have a doublet, there's uh, one neighboring hydrogen environment. If we have a triplet, there's two neighboring hydrogen environments. And if we have four peak groupings, we have three neighboring hydrogen environments. Um, and notice here how these uh, ratio of the peak sizes in the grouping uh, follow Pascal's triangle. I don't know why that is, but it's a nice little coincidence. And we can have, we call these singlets, doublets, triplets, and quartets. So the way you can the easy way to do it is just take the number of peak groupings, subtract one from it, and you get the number of adjacent hydrogen environments within your uh, within the number of major neighboring hydrogen environments of interest. So, if we consider uh, uh, one bromoethane, if we consider one bromoethane here, um, here here's our TMS peak zero, and we can notice here that. There are two peak groupings that correspond to about 3.75, I want to say, and about 1.9. Um, this is a, uh, a triplet, and this is a quartet. So this quartet here, um, so here it corresponds to A. And since this is a, uh, a triplet, no, no, a quartet, we know that there's three um, hydrogen in the neighboring environment. Um, and then here, we know that okay, since there's you know three uh, three peaks here, three minus one is two. There's two um, hydrogens in a neighboring environment, and that corresponds to A. So this peak here, its splitting corresponds to A, and A splitting corresponds to B. So to summarize, the number of peak groupings indicate the number of chemical environments for H. Uh, the chemical shift of the uh, the chemical shift of the peak grouping. It indicates the nature of the chemical environment. The integration of the peak grouping shows the number of uh, H atoms in that particular environment. And the type of grouping indicates the number of H atoms on adjacent carbon atoms. Lastly, there is one other spectroscopic tool that you're expected to know, which is X-ray crystallography. And the extent of which you're allowed exist to know is that it exists and we can use it to determine bond lengths, angles, and crystal structures.